wonderful introduction, uh, Yash. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And it's a great honor and privilege to be here with the August uh, panel uh, group uh, gathered here today. Uh, good afternoon, greetings, uh, Tansi Dato, Dr. Yusuf Basiron, all the dignitaries on the panel, of the panel. And uh, on an afternoon, on a mundane subject like palm oil, sustainability, we have 112 participants, so that's definitely uh, heartwarming. Now, as uh, Dr. Motwani has also already shared the import statistics, I will not dwell too much on the slide, but I'd like to show as one of the most populous countries in the world, with a surging middle class population, India's influence in the global markets is also bound to increase in this decade. Now, as you mentioned, Mr. Kansal, that in 2019, our imports dropped, or maybe the year after. No, that's primarily because of COVID-related lockdowns and uh, the Horeca industry was almost shut for two months, if you can, if you recall. So practically for two months, there was hardly any imports. So there was no imports at all. So that is a primary reason. But apart from that, India imports or requires roughly about 25 million tons of edible oils to meet its domestic requirement. And out of that uh, 25 million, 35, India is only able to produce roughly about 35% of, uh, uh, of its oil seeds production, mainly from primary and secondary sources. And remaining 65% is met through imports. India spends roughly about $480 billion on their import bill. And in the list of imports, it's uh, mainly about organic chemicals, petroleum, gold, and somewhere in the top list also comes veg oils. And very recently, this has made a lot of noise in the parliament too. Now this uh, whole uh, announcement about the Atmanirbhar Bharat and veg oils uh, production in the country to increase or scale up uh, oil palm cultivation this has been under discussion for a long time, but lately it has got a lot of momentum due to the rising import bill. Now, this slide is very, very crucial or important because just about uh, two or three days back, or if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 9th August, according to a report released by the Intergovernmental pan Panel on the Climate Change, this has raised serious concerns that global temperatures have already risen by 1.1 degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial times. And this warns that the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold was likely to be breached before 2040. This has given the rise of code red for humanity. This is very important. This should be a wake up call for all of us today, be it Malaysia, Indonesia, India. And why it is very important for India? Because this report very specifically says about the heat waves, the humid heat stress that will be more intense and more frequent. Snow covered areas and snow volumes will continue to decrease. Changes in monsoon precipitation are also expected. Like this year also in the beginning of the year, we heard uh, that we have uh, the Met Department and the Sky Met had announced a uh, good monsoon. But again, down the line, we saw the catchment areas were not receiving enough rainfall. Actually, Indian monsoon is seen in four phases. So first phase is not really an indicator itself, but these are weather anomalies with both annual and uh, annual monsoon and summer increasing, decreasing, more precipitation projected. So these will be a major concern. Now, without India, the idea of capping the goals, the sustainable uh, goal, it's not going to be possible. That is why the slide and the previous slide is very, very important for all of us here today. For scaling up agriculture, 
it's not only like talking about oil palm cultivation or um, having sustainable um, certification schemes alone. A lot more needs to be required, needs to be uh, implemented in the framework. The regulatory framework are needed is climate smart agriculture. And CSA, the climate smart agriculture is in line with the FAO guidelines of sustainability action plan for agriculture with commensurate objective of increased productivity. We all have been talking about PPP, profit, people, planet, profit. Now see, India's new era of economic growth represents a country with unique challenges like food security, during COVID, we all heard people discussing about, you know, the immunity food, what is the right food. But the question is, in a country like India, it is about right to food. So we talk about food security, demand for resources and environmental stresses like climate change, water shortages. We are having flash floods. Certain parts of the country is facing floods. And at the same time, there's water shortage in the other belt. So it's very important to, to direct the focus on sustainable practices in India now than ever before. And India has a very potential, uh, it has potential to play a very significant role in driving the sustainable practices. Now, sustainability is not just limited to environment protection as we normally see uh, fashion on social media. It also incorporates social and economic sustainability. Sustainable agriculture should be a strategy. And uh, it's unfortunate that some of these factors have not received the adequate attention that it deserves. We've already gotten a glimpse of the repercussions of ignoring the sustainability criteria. We are experiencing different weather conditions in a span of a week or rather at times in a span of a day. Morning is a different weather. By afternoon, it's like scorching summer and evening you feel like it's winter. So, and here there's no one agriculture model that we can just pick it up. So this is going to be a daunting task. There is no ready solution. We will have to make a tailor-made model for India. We just cannot pick up a Argentina, Brazil model or Malaysia, Indonesia model. India requires full focus and attention to develop its own model to address all these challenges. Now, value chain analysis. Uh, this is my request to Solidary Dad. Uh, this is about discussion and giving inputs. So value chain analysis can expose a lot of strategic and operational misalignment within the chain. This will bring out all the deficiencies that need to be addressed. So if we could have a complete value chain analysis and the consequential misallocation of resources, like in India, we have excess of rice, we have excess of wheat, um, rotting uh, due to uh, not having enough warehousing facilities or uh, good um, logistics. On one hand, we are having excess of crops. And on the other hand, we are major importers of visuals, for example. So the development of sustainable value chain analysis tools, this should identify not only the misalignments, but also give us business opportunities. No matter how much we talk, we sit and discuss and we debate over here. But unless we do not make it a profitable solution for farmers, for businesses and society, it is going to be only ending up as research papers. Next slide, please. So to achieve the results, it's very, very important to support the farmer. The farmer is going to be on the center of this whole action on this backdrop. And along with that, we need to ensure we provide good quality material, right? From uh, to start with good seedlings, good fertilizer, and be open to various different options. Focusing on precision farming. Um, it's time to accept and embrace artificial intelligence, um, the role of drones, remote sensing, 
So this will all put together help us bridge the gap between the consumer and the farm gate prices. Uh, there are different government schemes being announced, like Bhavantar scheme. That's one. So there could be various different schemes for different uh, areas that can be implemented. There is also need to scale up online price discovery. And as 15% more prices achieved in national agriculture market platform. So easy access to micro credits, um, land data, loans, loan availability. So move to gross value added uh, from agriculture will be a very beneficial step if we need to achieve these uh, huge ambitious goals. Next step, please. Next slide, please. It's a no brainer after seeing the IPCC report and all the other reports that we've been hearing about and reading about global warming, sustainable palm oil is the solution and, and the need. That is the need of the R right now. Now, what makes the MSPO a model for global sustainability is its capacity to contribute to nationwide conservation of landscape and wildlife species. The Malaysian palm oil industry, with the backing of the Ministry of uh, Primary Industries, Ministry of Environment and Water, has very effectively created a model of sustainable development. Also, they have been, the best part is, they have been revising these standards with continuous improved inputs, improved parameters regularly. So the later standards are expected to be concluded by 2021. And unfortunately, this deadline may be pushed a little bit, but these are um, this is a step in the right direction. And like I said, there is a lot that has been done in Malaysia in this sector, which India can learn from. Why sit and reinvent the wheel? Strategic production enhancement in agriculture is a comprehensive plan and would involve many measures. As I said, one, one, one size fits all will not work over here. It will require many small as well as big steps to take up to make oil palm cultivation a profitable venture on its own. Now, first of all, we all know it's a long gestation crop. So there is no silver bullet, no quick solution. Basically, after government's declaration of um, uh, the National uh, Mission on Edible Oils and uh, oil palm cultivation to be taken up in a big way. Government has also allocated some funds. It has been announced that there will be 11,000 crores dedicated for oil palm cultivation, but this is over the period of years. So it takes about four to five years for the first crop. So it's not about gestation, but the idea is this is a capital, this is going to be capital intensive in the initial years. And oil palm is not just an oil crop. It is a very economic and uh, economic and of social development and a provider of livelihood to many as palm plantations are very labor intensive and thereby very crucial for poverty alleviation. Next slide, please. So in the Indian context, uh, how this MSPO or what can be uh, adopted from this model is definitely work in progress. We have uh, been privy that um, the Solvent Extractors Association of India, the Solidary DAG and the government agencies together uh, have been working on this and they have come up with a Indian standard which complements MSPO and other standards. So in the Indian context too, it is a livelihood and employment providing economic opportunity and thereby a great fit. Now taking a cue from Malaysia, an ecosystem has to be created for a large scale development. Uh, there has to be some kind of farmer cooperative, government and private partnerships. And this is possible only with appropriate capital inflows. Microfinancial tie-ups, farm extension services are a must because otherwise it's only half-hearted attempt if you cannot get that. 
to start with, like I mentioned, good variety of oil palm seeds is a must. We recently received a request from the Telangana government to help them with the oil palm seedlings from Malaysia. So yes, it's, it's very important to have the right input material. A conducive environment has to be created for the entry of big capital, which can stand on its own in a sustainable manner. But uh, to be fair, uh, based on experience, small scale farmers can also become an integral part of the production and supply chain, you know, supply chain system but experience has taught us that on small scale production units, it is an uphill task to achieve the same result that we have in Malaysia. Basically, 4 million um, four metric tons per hectare oil output. But after discussion with various uh, government agencies in India, what we understand is rather even two uh, two metric tons per hectare, two, two and a half metric tons itself is also good for them. It will still be highest yielding compared to the other domestic oilseed crops in India. These are the results that we have seen um, for MSPO in the eyes of world. Initially, there were a lot of questions when MSPO was launched, but slowly after uh, years of hard work, World Resources Institute found as Efor mentioned, that over the last three years, Malaysia's rate of deforestation has decreased annually. And they are able to decrease this rate thanks to its uh, efforts in MSPO. Next slide, please. Ambitious sustainability targets often fuel innovation and solutions for environmental and social challenges, thereby unleashing growth in the process. It can act as a driver to improve profitability through operational efficiency, improving the relation of both the countries too. So in conclusion, I would only like to say that as recently Prime Minister Modi announced the National Mission on Edible Oils, already, the cultivate, already there's a debate going on on social media. This news has met with some criticism that palm oil expansion will threaten its forest and natural environment based on palm oil experience from Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, this is nothing but fear mongering and clickbait tactics employed by some section that is a bane of palm oil industry. And it's going to be a very tough task, uh, but it has to be taken up. What is really required here is education. A lot of education is required because it's not forex. There's no question of forest loss or forex loss. India can balance both. That's my concluding shot. Thank you.